from God our Father, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration today is from Matthew chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, people don't know how to talk to one another anymore. I suppose I should clarify what I mean by that. It's not because somebody has their nose buried in a device, but when you think, no, think about politics. People have a hard time being in the same room with one another when they have opposing views with one another. You see, we live in a society, in a culture that's called a cancel culture. Have you heard of this? Cancel culture is when someone gets upset with someone else for their view or for something that they said. And so they rally a few more voices, usually on social media, to try and call out this person for their behavior or what they said, and to publicly shame them. And they try to get it so that all of the social media turns on this individual. And maybe it even impacts them when it comes to the professional level. Somebody doesn't like the view that you have, and so they begin shouting and screaming to try and cancel you from your opinion. But if you live in a cancel culture like that, that really gets rid of good, healthy debate. It really gets rid of coming together and trying to sort things out. Now, there are still some venues where you see this happening a little bit, at least. There's a conservative comedian podcaster by the name of Stephen Crowder. And he does this bit where he will go to different universities, find a public space, and set up a table with this banner that says, Change My Mind. And he's not afraid to take on all the hot-button topics from gun control to abortion to how many genders there are. And so he invites people to sit down with him and try to change his mind. But instead of simply screaming at them, he allows them to make their case. And as they make their case, he responds with sound reasoning to show where he thinks they are wrong. And sometimes, I don't think he's had his mind changed yet, but sometimes he actually gets them to change their mind. Well, this morning in our lesson, we are going to see that there needs to be a change, and it's more than a change in our mind. It's also a change in our hearts, a change in our actions. And so as we look at the work of John the Baptist, we're going to see that we have this encouragement. We're going to see that we need a change. This needs to take place some way, somehow. So John the Baptist began his ministry, and he starts out in a place that you and I wouldn't really think would be a great place to start. If he was starting in Southern California, I suppose you might say, he went out to the Salton Sea and started a ministry out there. You go, what? Who does that? And yet, John started this ministry out in the Judean countryside, the wilderness, the desert area, and began preaching. And a remarkable thing happened. People from all over Jerusalem, several hours away, all the region, went out to hear what he was saying. In fact, John's message, or John's role here, had been long foretold. 700 years before this, the prophet Isaiah had said, A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Matthew tells us that was talking about John. He was out in the desert, and his role was to be the forerunner, as you see on the front of your bulletin. He was the, to be the one who would come before the Savior, and his job was to get people ready to receive the Savior. Look at his message, it's quite simple. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come to you. Get ready, because the Savior's coming, and you want to be ready for him. You want to be prepared for him. You want your heart and your mind and your actions to all be in line with what God has to say. And so, as you prepare for this Savior to come, this coming Messiah, make sure that you are turning from your sin and you are ready to receive it. Well, they've been waiting thousands of years. How much more ready do they need to be for the Savior to arrive? You see, some of the people there thought they were quite ready 
to receive the Messiah. They thought they had everything absolutely in order for his arrival. You have people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those religious leaders of the day. And like the rest of the crowds, they made their way out to, to the Jordan River, out in the wilderness, to go see this preacher, to hear what the big hubbub was about, and perhaps to be baptized. Because, you know, that was the thing to do, after all. You don't travel all the way out into the desert and not go up there and do the thing that he's being offered, that he's offering. But really, they were doing it for show. Some of these people in the crowd, they were doing it simply because they wanted to be seen as the most righteous people there, there were. And if this was one more hurdle that they could cross, if this was one more thing they could check off their list of showing themselves to be righteous before God, they were going to do it. And they had the reasoning in mind, too. They said, look at who we are. For God's chosen people. Out of all the nations of the earth, he chose the people of Israel, and that's us. And we have Abraham as our father. Remember Abraham? The one that the Bible describes as he was a friend with God? That's our, our forefather. He's the founder of our nation. We got everything in order, and we should be good to go. But if all else fails, they turn to themselves and said, look at the righteousness that we have. Look at how good we are. We are so good that God's commandments weren't good enough for us that we invented a few more to make sure we kept them really well. And so God will be pleased with us as he sees us. But now you look at that message that John was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Did it really apply to these people? Absolutely. He was talking to all those who remained unrepentant. All those who looked at themselves and said, we have nothing but goodness for God. All those people who looked at themselves and could see the sin that had invaded their bodies and their souls through and through. And so John comes on the scene preaching this message of repentance. If you want to be ready for the Messiah, if you want to be ready to receive the Messiah, then there is a need for repentance. You need to get right with God. Let's even think about that today. We look at what John is saying to these people. And he doesn't mix pleasantries with them. Imagine we would take the same approach that John did. We get a visitor to church and we say, You brood of vipers, what told you to come to church this morning? Probably wouldn't have a whole lot of visitors returning if that's the way you're greeting. But listen to what John says to these people. Because John knew they were coming for the wrong reasons. He says, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You see, John could see their motivation. They weren't coming for the right reasons. They were coming for the show of it. They were coming so that they could pat themselves on the back and doing one more thing to make themselves acceptable to God. They were so blinded by their own righteousness that they didn't see their need to be saved. Do we ever find ourselves thinking along the same lines as these Pharisees and Sadducees? Have we ever become so blinded by our own righteousness that we fail to see our need for repentance? Say, after all, we're Christians. We're here at church. I'm participating in the whole 10 for 10 stewardship emphasis. So God is going to be happy about that. I'm regularly exercising my faith and showing people just how godly I am by going to Bible class. So people see that, don't they? They see what a Christian I am. But the moment we start looking at all of these things and say, you know, these are things that I enumerate for God to say, this is why he should accept it. The moment I start giving myself any moment of, or any bit of credit for saying, God, this is why I'm your, your child and why you should love me. John has some words for us. 
the brood of vipers who warned you to flee the coming wrath. You see, if we're honest with ourselves, as much as we like to be seen as good, wholesome Christians, there's another side of us. We don't like people to see. We don't like people to see the anger that we sometimes have for others, and we try to keep that hidden and, and out of the view of others. We don't like people to see maybe the, the chemical dependency that we have to try and numb the pain. We don't like people to see the, the difficulty that we have and the struggle through life. And so we try to hide these things from people and not even being honest with ourselves with what we struggle with. <coughs> these things that we struggle with, these sins are things that need to be repented of, to be acknowledged of. You see, the way God works is he uses his word. He uses all those do's and the don'ts of his law to say, let me expose how you are not right with me. He pushes us right to that point of despair, right to that point of helplessness, right to that point where you're throwing up your hands in frustration and say, it's no use, I give up. And it comes with that good news. He wants us to see our inability on our own, our inability to live without him. So that we might cry out. So that we might hear the good news and the healing that he has for us. And he says, I'm preparing your heart for that good news of Jesus. Think of John's ministry. His ministry was to call people to repentance, to get them to be ready to receive the Savior in faith. And that's what God does for us in his word. He prepares our hearts. He tills that soil up so that it's ready to have that faith planted in, in it. So that he can feed it and he can water it and he can make it grow. And he says, you know what you need to do? I simply believe. And as you do, like a tree, like a fruit tree, you will show that you're good and healthy by the fruit that you produce. Because there's a warning he has here. He says, every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. If we start looking at our fruit and we start looking at ourselves as the ones to be the producers of the fruit, all we're going to find is this wormy, rotten stuff that is not pleasing to God. But he says, when you have that faith, when you are connected to me, when you are connected to your Savior, think of all the beautiful fruit that you can produce. Now you can Speak those words of kindness, even in a difficult situation. Now you can speak those words of support and encouragement, even when it's that person that it's a struggle to be encouraging and supportive to. Now you can see the vocation that you have in your life, whether it's a father or a husband or, or a student, an employer or employee, and you can embrace those and say, this is, I'm going to do these things to the best of my ability, not simply because the boss is watching, because I'm giving glory to God. That's good fruit. And every time we do that, he says, this is what gives me glory. You see, John saw that even though as powerful a preacher he was, he wasn't the guy. He said, I'm just here to get you ready for the guy. I'm just the warm-up act for the main show, and he's coming and going to be on the scene soon. On the scene soon. He says, I'm baptizing you with water, but people baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He pours out his Holy Spirit on us every time we get into this word, every time we're into the sacraments, using baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's God pouring out his Holy Spirit on us to work in our hearts. And it's powerful, and now it changes us to make us that do that complete U-turn. From people who are only willing and wanting to sin all the time to being people who want to walk in faith with him. He said this turn, this change has to take place. And I'm the one that's able to do it. I'm able to make that change in you so that it's, it's not just a small thing. But I'm giving you new life. I'm breathing this into you through the good news about Jesus so that this change can take place and it can be a lasting thing. So long as you have breath in this world, and it's going to impact you not only now, but for eternity. 
You see, we need that change, both for today and for the future. Because that's the only way we are going to have entrance into heaven. It's, it's because God made that change in our hearts. And now as we go through life, John told the people of his day, repent and produce that fruit that's in keeping with the repentance. Let your words and actions reflect that faith that's in your heart. As you go through life, think about leaving a fruit basket all over the place, everywhere you go with the fruit of your daily living that leaves no doubt as to who you are. Let your words be seasoned with grace and kindness as you speak with one another. Let your, your talents be used and not be mothballed or not be left with dust bunnies growing out of it. Use those talents you have to glorify them. Let your life be ones where you see an opportunity to share your faith. We have the opportunity this Christmas. What, what a natural time to invite somebody during the, during the church year, during the calendar year. This is the time to say, hey, come and see the Savior, just like the shepherds. Come and see what we have found in Bethlehem. It's our Savior. Use this as an opportunity to produce those fruits in keeping with repentance. Because you know what? As you share your faith, as you share that good news, you might just change somebody's mind. Not because you've used such sound argument or reasoning, but because you allow the Holy Spirit to work. You allow Jesus to work who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and the fire, and it's a powerful thing when someone goes from being a citizen of hell to being a citizen of heaven. You have those opportunities to produce those fruit. Let that change take place and let it be evident of all. God be with you as you prepare for the coming Messiah and be ready to receive him. Please stand. Now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in singing our response.